Today is August 28th. It says 28th in the show notes. 2017, you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 55. We have stories all about how Amazon's next move for world domination is teaching kids how to write. We're also checking in with the benefits of combining BCIs or brain computer interfaces if you're, uh, you know, into all that fancy talk with VR. And we're putting a face on blockchain and more. Go ahead and grab your dragons. I'm just kidding. There's no there's no uh, Game of Thrones spoilers on this podcast. We're not that kind of podcast. But Human Factors Cast starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Blake, I think that may have been our longest intro that we've had. And there were dragons in it. There were dragons in it. But uh, how about that Game of Thrones finale? Well, season oh, finale. Oh, my goodness. I didn't see any of it. You didn't see any of it? Well, okay, we're not going to spoil it on the show. But uh, I'm sure some of our listeners are sympathizing with me going, Blake, you need to watch this so we can talk about it. Hi, guys. Welcome oh, back. I totally get it, man. <laughs> I totally get it. I'm just so far behind because uh, my girlfriend wants to read the books before she watches the show. Oh, man. And if I don't have anybody to talk about it with, I will spill the spoilers, Ooh. so I'm, I'm the worst. You're that guy. All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf over there. What up? Happy Monday, Nick. Happy Monday, Blake. Okay, so what's been going on with you, buddy? I see, I see you have a lot of bantery things in the show notes. There's like... Hang on, let me count these bullet points. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You got like 14 bullet points here, dude. Yeah, that's too many bullet points, man. I got to stop with that. But that's just I how have, I roll. To, but anyways. On, really quick, <laughs> for comparison, I have two, and you have 14. Yeah, that's really true. <laughs> okay, yeah. jump into it. Go. But anyway, so last week we answered, I think it was a Reddit question about what free mock-up tools people use. And I, I don't know, I had been using two that are like probably the most paid for tools there are over the weekend. And it was it was nuts, the comparisons between the two of them. So what I'm talking about is Sketch, which is primarily like an iOS prototyping tool. Uh, it's it's pretty good. I mean, you, you can get away with a lot of it. It's pretty cheap. There's not a lot of tools, so it's not like a lot large learning curve. But over the weekend, I was helping my girlfriend make some invitations for a shower that her girlfriend's having or something like that. And man, like I that. just noticed how powerful Photoshop can be from a designing like print to web design kind of stuff. But geez, is the learning curve kind of steep. Like I, I would be nowhere and have gotten nothing done without a lot of help from YouTube. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd throw that, throw that out there. Like I'd just done a little bit of work in both. And found like Sketch to be awesome because it's cheap and it's really quick. But man, Photoshop has some s serious power behind it, and you can do some crazy mockups with that. Thing. You know, people always laugh at me when I put GIMP on my uh, resume. And man, GIMP is also pretty powerful. And I'm going to be an advocate for GIMP here because it is free. So going on with that that whole uh, thread from last week of what's a good free tool, GIMP is pretty good too, and it's. Not as powerful as Photoshop, but man, it's up there. Oh yeah, actually, I think it was one of your current coworkers and my previous ones that got me into using GIMP while I was there because I didn't have like a Photoshop license or any of that stuff. Oh and yeah, it's it's awesome. Oh, and it's GIMP free. is great. GIMP is great. I use it. <laughs> I use it pretty great. Um, hey man, so you have you're an iOS guy, right? Well, I traditionally am, but I don't know if you remember, I've recently swapped over and my main laptop is a Windows machine. Oh, oh, no, I did not. I, I forgot that for some reason. But you are, okay, so you're primarily iOS, but, but you have an iPhone? Yes, I do. Okay, so so my partner, she, um, the other week, I guess, well, I guess it was last weekend, right, right before the show, uh, so I didn't have a chance to talk about it, but, uh, so we ran into a problem with her phone right it wouldn't it wouldn't turn on or anything and i i know nothing about ios like i'm an android guy i'm a pc guy i don't really do a whole ios thing uh i'm not one of those android versus apple people like that's it's do what works for you all right and android works for me and iphone works for her it's fine but 
she was getting really frustrated because her phone would turn off and it wouldn't turn on and there was no way to really diagnose the problem and I'm pretty good with electronics and I can usually diagnose these problems fairly easy. I had no idea what I was doing on iPhone. So I did what any sensible person would do and I plugged the thing into my computer and Googled, you know, how do I fix this? And they just said, download iTunes and it'll take care of the rest. I was like, no, there's no way that's that simple. So, you know, aside from the uncomfortable icky feeling of having iTunes installed on my computer for all of 20 minutes, uh, it completely took care of the recovery and it saved all the pictures and everything. So there was really no danger. Like I just plugged the thing in and it said, okay, let me check this thing out. Let me do everything. for Just leave, just leave it plugged in. I'm doing everything. You just go make a sandwich or something. I'm going to sit here and do this. And then when we turned it back on, it worked. And it was, dude, that is incredible. Especially since you, were you on a Windows machine when you did this? I am. Yeah, we don't have any Mac machines in our house other than her iPhone. So yeah, it was just Windows, iTunes, and I just, or yeah, I plugged it in and and it worked. And I was I was really amazed by kind of this user experience of how to basically fix your phone. Like they just did everything. They diagnosed the thing. They applied the correct update to it. Like it just it all worked. And I was really shocked that it worked that efficiently. And I was just having a great time. I was like, wow, that's, I want to talk about that on the show. Well, that's an awesome story for the week, man. Jeez, I didn't realize that they'd come so far with iTunes. Cause I remember back in the day, it was, it was kind of a painful program to use. But obviously, I mean, it's come a long way. Oh, dude, I uninstalled it right after that, though. Don't, don't get oh, me wrong. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if anything does go wrong, I, I do know that that's an option. And maybe some of our listeners didn't, but now they do. So that's, that's another thing. All right, so Nick, what's the second point you've got in our banter notes? Oh, that is literally just shorthand for Black Mirror Season 4. Uh, did you see the trailer? <laughs> yeah, I did. I just love that you shortened it like that. I would I, never know what that well, was. Yeah, yes, I, I did see the trailer. It looks intense per the usual. Man, so I... Okay, I just want to talk about this because I'm, I'm worried that it's going to go away from its roots too far. There's a, a, a glimpse in the trailer, and... If any of our listeners are sensitive to spoilers, I would hesitate to call this a spoiler, but it's kind of a setting thing. So if you're if you're worried about that thing, go ahead and skip forward like 20, 30 seconds. Okay, we're good. Right, they're going to space. That's a, that's a little too science fiction-y for me, I think. Oh, I don't know. Because uh, there's been some pretty futuristic episodes before. Yeah, it has it hasn't really like swayed me or anything, but but space. It, I think the yeah, space part is what's space getting is a me. whole different frontier for the show. It is, but but I mean, the, you're four seasons in. I mean, you start digging deep and coming up with probably some wackier ideas by that time. Because I mean, it's a pretty serious show, and there's so much diversity in its content from episode episode to episode. I don't know, man. Yeah, but I, it, it could ruin it. You might be right. I don't or know. It might be it, straying away from its uh, roots. It'll just be interesting to see how they spin it. I mean, the whole show is about our relationship with technology, and I, I'm I'm really interested though, just to see kind of it's it's interesting from our perspective as human factors folks, right? Like we we watch these shows and are like, yes, no, we are the people responsible for this relationship that you have with technology, and you know uh, some of these unique situations, right? Like. I don't know. It's it's just an interesting perspective, and it'll be interesting to see what they have for season four. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's kind of funny. We, we talked a long time ago. It, we talked about this with Billy, right? Like breaking down kind of the human factors aspects of like movies and maybe TV shows. Oh, yeah. This one would be a super interesting one to do just because it's it's pretty out there, but it poses a lot of serious questions about the implications of technology, especially like this very high mind <laughs> aspect of data. Yeah, so, I so. agree. We should uh, we should do a commentary track on each one of these episodes just to and throw it out there and see. see. I don't know. Would would our listeners be interested in that? Would you guys be interested in that? Let us know because uh, I'd be happy to sit down with watch black mirror with you and just pump out some of these commentary or at least for season four i don't know i think it'd be fun it so, would be it i would don't know be. maybe we'll do, let's do like one and throw it out there who all knows right. yeah let's let's see how it goes all right well uh i think we should get into the human factors news what do you think uh let's get into it man we got some juicy ones this week yeah we do this is the part of the show all about human factors news this could be anything you name it as long as it deals with the field of human factors no you 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 are hearing correctly i did not read 
all those things in between because it takes too long and now the explanation is taking longer. <laughs> Human Factors News. Blake, what's up first? All right. So, ladies and gents, it's once again that time where we get to relish, it, relish in some of Elon Musk's goodness. So, this week, Musk made big waves on Instagram, premiering a pic of SpaceX's astronaut suit. So, the pic was not a full shot of the actual suit, but it gave us plenty to speculate about on t- in terms of its design. So, Musk claims that this is a real-life working spacesuit, not a prototype, and that it has been tested in a double vacuum in double vacuum pressure for ocean landing mobility, and in various other safety runs. It's expected that more shots of the suit will emerge over the coming days, and it's also speculated that the suit may eventually be worn by astronauts in NASA's commercial crew program. Now, this thing looks like something from a film. Like, it doesn't even look all that real, because it's just so different from a traditional spacesuit. Well, hey, Blake, I got I got a little surprise for you you want to know what do you got you want to know why this thing looks like it's straight out of a film uh why because it was crafted by a hollywood costume designer renowned for making batman and wolverine figure hugging outfits yes that's very very <laughs> true <This laughs> thing... you know it's kind of hilarious or i don't know there's like a small irony here about this particular article the design and the design of it is I'm reading a book about the interfaces in sci-fi and what we can learn and what we can't learn from them, like what you can and can take away from what we see in Hollywood. That's interesting. Yeah, so it's it's kind of another little parallel, but in this case, it's like designing a full astronaut suit. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, first off, space is sexy, and the fact that we have to wear these big, stupid, diaper-looking behemoths when we do space, it's it's dumb. And something like this, man, I want to strap into this thing and go to the stars. Like this is this is hard sci-fi, and we are we are living in a reality now where the spacesuits now mirror how cool it is to be an astronaut, and I'm jealous. Oh, for sure. But the the cool part about it is it does look slick and super space age, but it's probably much more functional from like. Oh, uh, yeah moving around in it yes. aspect compared to like the old bulky suits we're used to that like the giant orange you know almost hazmat looking suits absolutely yeah and and one thing with those is that i know a lot of the joints move on bearings right metallic bearing metal bearings and this one looks like it's all just one piece and oh man like i i can just thinking about the ergonomics of this i feel like they'd be able to move a lot easier in this um and you know they did put a lot of I mean, he even said in his Instagram, like he said, you know, it was incredibly hard to balance aesthetics and function. And uh, it was apparent that they are actually going for function here with this one instead of just looking cool. But man, they pulled off both. I got to say. Yeah, I keep hoping that they're going to do more full body shots of the actual suit because I'm assuming there's got to be maybe a respiration device on the back or I want to see if there's any kind of differences in how they did the legs. Like, are they bulkier? Do they have specific boots they're putting on them that are maybe better for different kinds of gravity or different surfaces? Right, right. Uh, So there's a a lot of stuff still to be found, but this was an awesome uh article that you pulled just because it's it's so cool to see how far technology has come that we're uh, we're pretty much following what the movies used to look like like back to like space 2001 odyssey now as of the record as of this recording uh this was posted five days ago and i am looking right now on google to see if there's any full body shots of of because he says in this thing there's there's more more details to follow and I'm wondering if... Um, yeah, now it's been a few days. You're right, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's anything out there. It's just some news on his hyper Hyperloop pod thing. I I see... Mm, it's the same picture. All right, there's no new news on that. But, man, yeah, uh, hats off to them, them guys over at SpaceX for uh, really designing something that both looks awesome and is functional. That is... Th- th- when you have, whenever you can have those two together, you get you get a great product. I think. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, especially when we're talking about, I know the article mentions NASA's uh, Z two suit, and when you kind of look at, look at pictures of both of them, it's just completely different. Like 
the SpaceX suits oh look goodness, so yeah. <laughs> functional and uh, usable and they don't look they don't like they look space age right but it's much more like humanoid esque like if you look at the Z2 it looks something like the robot from um I don't know movie where the guys yelling it run real well will robinson but it looks oh, like some lost in space. crazy suit lost in space is the reference you were looking for lost. there we go lost <laughs> in space thank you nick to me this looks like a krogan from mass effect that yeah that's a much better comparison right there it i don't know it just it looks it looks very outlandish but who knows maybe there's functional purpose to it that i'm not aware of because of the specs yeah it could be i don't know but yeah I'm I'm glad we have humans, humanoid looking things. And I mean, l- let me just be clear: we are not like promoting Elon Musk here. I've been I've had my fair share of criticisms in the past, and I just think this is one of those pieces of work that deserves uh, recognition because the team working on this did a phenomenal job, at least from the image that we've seen. Oh yeah, we'll we'll look for more and maybe post those throughout social media and do some commentary on them there. Oh yeah, 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 we'll do. Um, all right, Blake, you want to move on to the next story here? Yes, indeed. All right, so moving on to a little Amazon news. So back in 2013, Amazon acquired an education tech startup called Ten Marks, and Ten Marks' goal was to help teachers and parents create easy to digest math curriculums for young students. Now, Amazon and Ten Marks are introducing Ten Marks Writing, a cloud-based writing curriculum designed to help fourth to sixth grade kids become better writers and to help teachers with reviewing and providing feedback on their students' work. Amazon says that the key to success has been making these curriculums fun and engaging for kids, encouraging them to want to enjoy writing. And I have to say, there's nothing, there's never been a truer statement than trying to design something that makes kids want to learn by making it fun. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, it's the big challenge, right? And if they can, if they are the ones to finally crack it, I mean, People have been trying to catch, crack this nut for years, right? People have been designing these educational games to try to force some interaction. Um, they've designed whole curriculum that kind of center around a uh, an interaction rather than just a lecture base, right? And there's there's a bunch of different educational tools that are being used. This is just one that is owned by the biggest online retailer. <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, with that, though, they have a lot of money to throw at this thing. And so hopefully, hopefully this thing will, um, you know, the reason I put this even in the notes is because there's a whole user experience aspect to this that that has to be considered. Right. So they're they're designing for a very specific demographic children. Uh, they're they're also designing to get them interested and engaged and. They have to accomplish the goal of actually educating them and, you know, allowing them to retain this information. And so there are there are several really complex sort of uh, conflicting goals here that this program has to do. And it's it's tough to design, man. Like, that's a really tough challenge. And I'll be interesting to it'll be interesting to see where this whole project goes. But, um, you know, they're they're looking to test this out with seventh and eighth graders very soon. So. We'll we'll eventually have some data on this to see how, you know, children are uh, sort of reacting to this and, and what how effective it is. Yeah, and looking at the Engadget article itself, like it's got a couple screenshots from the UI, and it's awesome. I mean, they've basically taken some classwork and made it into a little bit of a gamification user experience right yeah so you you can even pick like the exercises that you want to do and it looks like they add up to be some amount of credit or points and who knows what the like reward system is but i mean it's covered with fun animations and very easy to use and sensible um you know ui elements uh lots of big buttons all that kind of stuff for kids um, and it even, it looks like the backside of it, I think that's the second screenshot, is much more geared for, like, um, sorry, geared for teachers. And, I mean, I've had a little bit of experience with some teaching platforms before when I was in grad school, being on the opposite side of it, like being the graduate aid. And those things are so hard to use. Lunky Blackboard. I, sorry. Yeah. Calling them yeah. Out. Yeah, I was trying to keep names out of it, but yeah, Blackboard <laughs> is very hard to use, or it was for me. And it looks like this has a lot of automation built in it, so that teachers are focusing more on the provision of feedback versus just trying to get 
the system to work or figure out where to go. Right. Comment on here is that they've actually they're 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 providing examples that would be analogous to how they would interact with the real environment, right? So so in this first screenshot, are you looking at this? It says, Welcome back, Lisa, and there's a there's a burst thing here, right? So it says, uh, pick one to write, and it gives you like just quick little little things, right? And it can tweak your writing just based on these things. So one of them is a post-it note that just asks a quick couple, couple questions about you. There's a text message one that allows you to text back and forth between a pet bird in a cage and a free bird outside, right? So this is an example of writing a text to somebody. And then you also have commenting on images. And if, you know, so so there's this emphasis on keeping your writing skills together, no matter what the context is, whether it's in the context of a text message, whether it's in the context of an essay, or whether it's in the context of commenting on somebody's Instagram picture of their cat. Yeah, you know what's kind of more about the the commenting on the cat and the, in this case, I think it's a giraffe picture, Yeah, is maybe that helps to create kind of awareness in social media when you're making comments on pictures that aren't yours, like trying to... I don't know, make sure that you're conveying things that are kind or nice. Like maybe that's this sets them up for that versus oh, like I don't a lot know. of the kind of vulgarity we see. I don't know if it'll do that, but it might stop them from saying LOL and make, you know, uh, this made me laugh or something, you know, something a little bit more human readable and relatable unless, I don't know. I, I feel like that's, that's kind of the purpose of uh, these exercises here with the writing, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. They could be totally trying to, um, social engineer our youth and uh, <laughs> I'm starting to sound like a where's my tinfoil hat Blake, oh my, yeah you better put it on got my tinfoil hat where is it all right <laughs> got it on okay so anyway yeah uh, no but I, I think all these exercises are really great and well at least from what I've seen and uh, you know it'll like I said it'll be interesting once we have data but give me the data before I make a full full uh, decision on it oh for sure I think the the biggest part to me was it seems like the cost to use this is relatively, I don't know, it's relatively low. I mean, it's they're saying in the article it's about like four bucks per per student per year, and I feel like licensing for more advanced programs would be a lot more than that at this point. So it's it's probably good that this particular startup, Ten Marks, has been partnered with Amazon because they are like pioneers of the low cost. Right. Yeah. So my my biggest. I mean, you could assign it for homework, but how do you get students to do this? How do you? Make yeah, it I mean, that's all about what this reward system actually is. I'm yeah. not sure because I mean, it's, it's got like card. some kind of point system, but I'm not sure what what that means. What does it give them? It'd be cool if you uh, completed a curriculum and uh, it gave you an Amazon gift card or something. Now that would be serious incentive. I mean, because they're still making money. It's it's basically a discount on whatever, you know. Yeah, and I mean, this is targeted like fourth to sixth graders. You doesn't have to be like ba- bank breaking amounts of money. Right. I mean, it could literally yeah, be. That's, that's a great question right there, though. Like, what is, how is this going to push people to use it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what kind of shakeup this has in uh, the textbook industry, right? Because they're, they're making a lot of money. And, um, you know, if this is if this proves to be more effective, a more effective way of teaching, then uh, I don't want to say it's the the end of the industry, but it should it it could you know potentially throw a dent in it, or at least change oh, it up. I think you're right. I mean, there's definitely going to be a shift in these kind of technologies being developed. And I mean, to take it a step further, and again, this is maybe me overstepping the idea here, but I mean feasibly this could reduce the need to actually have kids in classrooms every day because if you are forced to do the homework and you have the ability to interact with a teacher or a really highly developed chat bot that can answer most of your questions and gets a teacher when it's necessary i mean it provides an entirely different learning environment yeah yeah i know you're absolutely right i mean yeah i just i can't i just can't wait to see where this goes Super cool stuff. All right, Blake. Uh, always cool. Anything else on this one before we move on? No. What you got? L- uh, well, is this where I thank our uh, friends? This is where I thank our friends. <laughs> it is. <laughs> thank you for all. 
<laughs> wow, that's a show. Uh, thanks to everyone over at Engadget, Fast Co Design, and Science Daily for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along as we find these articles, you can follow us all over social media for links to them as we find them. And uh, we uh, occasionally will send out a comment or two with them just to say, hey, look, these are cool, and we're going to talk about these on the show. Okay, Blake, what do we got up next? <laughs> all right, so everybody, you strap on your tinfoil hats because this one's going to go a little bit deep. So the global supply chain of goods is an incredibly complex pr- complex system. So it requires millions of ships, airplanes, trucks, and trucks to bring goods to th- goods across thousands of miles, across national borders, and changing hands along the way. What's more is that this complex global system runs on good old-fashioned paper forms for keeping records. With so many transactions, so many changing of hands between goods and and not to mention the crossing of borders, this is almost unimaginable. But blockchain could possibly change all of this. So there are many many industries that are looking to make blockchain part of their business model, and it's easy to see how such a technology could be used in the global supply chain amongst other businesses. Blockchain could indeed streamline complex networks of transactions into a verifiable record that every member of the supply chain has access to. There's just one issue, just a small issue. As blockchain makes its way into the mainstream, it's going to need a user-friendly interface. So, Nick, have you heard about blockchain? Do you know a lot about it? So before I read this article, the uh, the most I knew about blockchain was what it it was the sort of driving uh, force behind Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, I invested a little bit into Bitcoin and I I read up on blockchain as far as that goes, but I mean, no, like long story short, no, I know a little bit in that it, it, it's kind of like these unique, oh geez, I, I am literally doing this without looking at the notes, Blake. So, (laughs) so, uh, help me out here if I get it, if I get any of these wrong, but it's sort of this unique, um, sequence of, of, uh, numbers, I guess. And, and, uh, at least how Bitcoin works is they have these um, processors that help try to uh, solve it. Okay. Tell yeah. Me how- I think that, I think you actually <laughs> have a better technical understanding than I do. That's for sure. Just, just listen to you talk about it. So you obviously know a good bit more. And if you invested in Bitcoin, I'm sure you at least had some pretty peripheral knowledge about how it worked. Well, why don't you, why don't you tell me the uh, actual thing so I can see how wrong I was. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Okay, so I, th- I think you're still right, but just to give some basics, so what blockchain is, is it's a digital record of transactions that are cryptographically secured, and they're effectively a digital ledger that works a bit like a Google Doc. So think about it in the terms of a Google Doc. If somebody adds some text like we do to our show notes, you can see the changes, and you know who made them and when. Similar things happening with blockchain. And this, like Nick had mentioned, has been popularized as the structure bu- structural framework behind Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency. Ah, uh, okay. I remember now. So, yeah, blockchain basically, uh, it has this record of who sent who what, and there's a bunch of, um, the processing power comes from verifying these. I th- I, I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, no, I think you are too, because I, th- that's, I know the article talks about it a little bit more in depth um, towards the end, but there's a whole thing about the fact that when you're using blockchain, it can actually mark and verify that a record was made, who made it, what, when it was made, to who, what it pertains to, yeah. all that kind of stuff, and it's all cataloged. So that information exists versus like paper forms where it's kind of up in the air, what gets passed to who, and does it get there in the right form, all that kind of good stuff. Right, right. Okay, so we want to put blockchain behind sticks of our trade, essentially is what this article is saying. And in order to do that, we need to design some sort of interface to understand uh, all the details. Sounds just like a table to me. Why, why can't we just provide this in like a table view? The transaction, and here's all the data associated with it. Well, I mean, there's obviously the whole, I want to see, you know, how many of these uh, transactions I've done. I want to see, uh, you name it, whatever the metric is, it, it probably exists and, and we have to design for that, right? So that's that's yes, answer for you. And I yes. think it's because people have gotten away from tables because they're just not as sexy. as. like, I know that 
uh, CO design in the here mentions like an IBM interface that's kind of like I guess click on them and get table views like you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but the the other like real implication I think is we've got to figure out how to break it apart so it's not a table that's so long that nobody's going right, right, right. to bother to node based uh, relationship display that that you're talking about from IBM. They have a screenshot of this and I mean, that's a good start. Go into logistics, the relationships between, like you said, there's a ton of metadata associated with when, where, how, why, how much, um, uh, how long did it take, all these questions that need to be answered. And it all kind of depends on the coming for when they come to this thing. Are they, are they looking for a specific piece of data? Are they looking for um, just a summary of what happened? Are they looking just to kind of super supervisory control, making sure everything's running a okay. deep dig into some of the metrics and see how they're being impacted by certain what the user's needs are? Yeah, and I think that's really where IBM is, or that's like the best place they can be, right? Is in, And something else to mention is this is a big framework is applied. We're going to have to do a pretty serious user needs analysis and like context of use for each specific case because here we're getting so much data that can be like it can be from anybody from just somebody who's bicycling in goods to the that so it's just going to be super tiered and like you're talking about with the need to my boss and things like that right yeah no it'll be uh, i'm i'm excited about this so it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they implement this and and uh, what kind of design coming a little more mainstream like we've got the really serious advanced technology for encryption now yeah, for sure uh <laughs> future looks pretty internet-y i like that internet -y. so there's there's a record of who sent who what if somebody sent something to somebody else there's that verification feature and um uh, a system to sort of display this all right um, do you have documentation? Cause I mean, saying blockchain to people, it's going to be like, I don't even know what that is. I'm not going to trust that. I'm going to trust. Go ahead and move on to my favorite story of the week. Alrighty. So researchers from the universe stated that this work is the first to demonstrate that brain computer interfaces can prove this story. I actually tweeted about it. Um, a couple, couple hours before the show today, being cognizant of how they look affects how is sort of that uh, feedback loop and, even uh, that combined with the EEG. So, is there if I just break down some of go the study it. specifics yeah. for the uh, for the audience? Yes, go for. It. Was they didn't previously know if a brain computer interface was a practical help, practical practitioner. So that's your virtual avatar. Um, so participants were hooked up with this. Six yeah. So all these things together, um, they they were able to help these people, right? Uh, what, do you want me to read that? You're highlighting it? <laughs> oh, no, that was just a no for me. <laughs> okay, okay, just making sure. Um, but <laughs> we, uh, we have a Google Docs open for pulling back the curtain. Blake just highlighted something, and I didn't know if he wanted me to cover it. Uh, no, so the, they're using all this technology together. So the, the EEG, in order to tell what areas of the brain are responsible for the gate and whether or not there were any problems with that, those, those areas, right? So they compared uh, the... And... Um, and then also uh, combine that with the avatar, right? They activated by the motion sensors themselves, and then um, th those actually mimicked the test subject. That, that's the mirror, right? And then they actually, the BCI. So the avatar was controlled by those, those uh, areas in the brain that they were monitoring for, right? Yeah, yeah. That was the part that kind of blew me away a little bit in the study is they... Because I got confused halfway through. One of the researchers mentions that it's often seen in this kind of research that you have like some kind of initial decoding of errors because somebody has to get used to the fact that they're controlling with their mind something that's walking in front of them, not like with their legs or with arm movements. So at first I didn't really understand that, but your explanation right there made it make a lot more sense about what was actually going on. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, you know, you'd know you be able to tell if something's wrong if you're using parts of your brain and your, your avatar's walking weird, right? And that, or, or sorry, not weird, uh, different. And then um, the same thing could be said for just the avatar, and if those things are analogous, then you could just theoretically use brain waves to break this down. Which just, it's, that seems so far out of reach, but obviously it's not. Future's um, here, man. Black Mirror. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, right? We're not even going to walk with our uh, 
with our brains anymore. We're- yeah, there we go. Just put us in a vat. We'll send out waves. You're, you're welcome, Netflix. That's your next episode of Black Mirror right there. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So you had that thing highlighted. Did you want to bring this up? Uh, I just thought it was uh, interesting, at least, that by watching, when the subject was like just controlling the avatar with their brain, you were still seeing a lot of the same activity areas in the brain that are involved in motor learning and also like error monitoring. So similar to what we talked about early, earlier that some of the researchers mentioned in the article, like just, just the idea of you're not actually walking, but thinking about walking or thinking about the process, you're activating those same brain right. areas and enacting that on an avatar in front of you. And that's, that's just pretty crazy to me. What what I really want to know is when and what the follow up study will look like because this was actually done with healthy people, so it's yet to be actually tested in patients with these right. kind of gait problems. That's the next step, right? Is to use this with uh, actual gait disability patients. Yeah, yeah, and I wonder how that will go and what the what the kind of changes over time will be and how quick they'll be. It'll it'll be a great study, and I can't wait to read the next one. Oh yeah, for sure, uh, worth following. Anyway, um, all right, man, do you want to get into some of the community stuff? Shall we? Yes, we shall. Okay, so first off, let's go ahead and get to a Twitter question. This one's from UX Andreas again. He loves writing in, and we love hearing from him. But you guys can write in, too. We're at H-Factors Podcast, and you can tweet at us with the hashtag HFCast. So you can do that, and we'll read your tweets on the show. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) We'll read them. We'll read them and maybe respond with some maybe sound advice. Maybe. I don't know. We'll, we'll read we'll them. We'll give you some banter. We'll, we'll give you that. We'll give you some banter. We might reply to you on Twitter, but we'll definitely read it on the show. And, uh, you know, unless it's like, what what's your favorite type of hot dog? I I, I mean, I'll answer it on the show. I don't care. What? Let's do it. What's I your, like it. What's your favorite All type questions of, ever on, on now, the HF podcast. Hold on. Hold on. Now that we've asked the question, Blake, what's your favorite type of hot dog? Are you like a Are you like a chili dog kind of guy? Or are you like a... Uh... Okay. So there's a very, very specific answer to this question. Oh, man. This is like a tremendous example. All right. Go. Yes. So my favorite type of hot dog is a chili cheese hot dog from this well-renowned place in Atlanta, only in the one that's downtown, called The Varsity. That is my favorite hot dog. The Varsity's Chili Cheese Dog. Oh, yeah. How about you, Nick? You got a fave? Oh, man. So I don't have a fave from a place. I got a favorite type. Uh, It's just a classic, you know, beef beef hot dog um, with uh, the following. So uh, diced onions, uh, ketchup, mustard, relish, and uh, that's it. I'm I'm pretty simple, but as long as it's got you know ketchup, mustard, relish, and diced onions, I'm good to go. I like it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to try it. It's fairly simple. All right, should we get to the, we should get to this Twitter question? All right, so UX Andreas writes. We went off the rails with that one. How do you how do you deal with being overwhelmed by all there is to learn and keep up with to date with uh, with of UX? I could have read that better. I'm sorry, UX Andreas. I didn't do it justice. Anyway, how do you deal with being overwhelmed by all there is to learn and keep up to date with in the field of human factors, or human factors, UX, all of it, right? Okay, Blake, I want to know how you keep up with the up to date with stuff. The the true answer is I get overwhelmed all. So how do you deal with it? There's no real good way not to be overwhelmed, or I guess for me, because I have always been the type of person that I just want to learn and proficient if not great at everything and ux is a really big field when it comes to that because i mean you're talking about design trends being able to use multiple different um prototyping tools i'm really trying to teach myself front end and hopefully in the future some like full stack development so there just always seems like there's so much to learn on top of trying to be a really good human factors practitioner and remember all the methodologies that I learned in school and how to apply it and how it can help users. Like it's, it's a difficult thing to navigate. And recently I've through some of the social media that I do. Oh, Blake. I th- I th- yeah. I think we lost you for a sec. Recently through social media is the last thing I heard. Oh, okay. So recently through social media for the UX nonprofit that I help out, like I've been reading a bunch of articles 
kind of about this and the like almost anxiety inducing problem of just being so overwhelmed and the the only thing that i could pull out of them that was sound advice was just to set very specific goals about what you want to be able to achieve and focus on only that don't let too much other noise seep into what you what you want to be good at so if you want to be a good amount of time have deliverables like develop those smart goals I, uh, that's kind of the only answer I have. I do get overwhelmed all the time, but I try my best just to focus my attention. Blake, I think that's sound advice, not just for you know the field of UX, but I think just in life. If you want to get good at something, practice and practice and practice until you're there, or at least you're happy enough, and then develop a new skill, and then just move on to the next one and kind of prioritize based on where your interests are. Um, in terms of being overwhelmed with the field of human factors and UX, like this is one of the reasons that we founded human factors cast like we wanted to provide an outlet to where we would sort of uh, and regurgitate them in the context of human factors right there's all these things going on well how do we how do we sort of relate that back to the field of human factors and how uh, i've you know talked with some of our listeners who have heard an idea on the show from another lab across the country or across the world and they have said you know that's a really great idea i had no idea that what stuff was being going on in that lab and uh you know we're taking that idea it just it kind of helps the community grow a little bit and so that's that's one of the whole reasons was because i was feeling really overwhelmed with wow there's a lot of news how do i digest this how do i you know bring this back to the field of human factors um and uh by doing that, it helps me stay up to date with what's going on, and I can, I can again, pull these examples from multiple labs and uh, pull this into my own work. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one way that I do it. Um, and I want to echo Blake's, Blake's point again. That was just a, that was a great point, man. Like, <laughs> in anything, uh, try, try, try again until you feel like you're at an appropriate level of mastery and then move on to the next. So... I think that's could have said it better myself, Nick. You're the yeah, well. You're the man too for helping me bring all these news stories to our listeners every week. Because uh, without you, I would have no one to read the news. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a wonderful day on Human Factors Cast. Oh, so, man. Nick, do we have time for a Reddit question? Oh, we do, we do. But first off, I want to just want to thank you. Uh, UX Andreas for writing in and tweeting to us. Uh, we always love these interactions with you guys. So if you want to jump on this train and have your fe- question featured on the show, you can tweet us your questions at two at H Factors Podcast using the hashtag HFCast, like I mentioned earlier. Okay, let's get to the it came from Reddit section. Uh, this is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you the topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion uh, among both Blake and myself and can uh, also encourage discussion amongst the community. So let's go ahead and get into it. Today's uh, entry was found on the user experience subreddit by, oh, I'm going to mess this up, Blues and Souls. Oh, no, I didn't mess it up. It was all good. Uh, Blues and Souls asks, I want to learn all I can about UX design. Are there any free courses, tips, or books that I can read? So, Blake, I want to hear what you got. What are your resources? What do you use? Uh, the tip. So just rewind the podcast 30 seconds and do what we talked about earlier. Don't overwhelm yourself. <laughs> Focus your attention. If you... Oh, we, lo- we, we lost you again there, Blake. What, what were you saying? Uh, if you just keep trying and stay motivated. I mean, basically what we had said before, that's the biggest tip I can give you. Um, let's focus your attention. Excellent. Uh, in terms of books... Uh, I've got like three that I like to always recommend. So one's called Measuring the User Experience. That's by Tolson Albert. Um, that's got a lot of methods in it. One's called Picture This. This helped me with like just enhancing my graphic design skills if, you get, if that's something you need. And then there's a big book that you can search for on the internet for a PDF because it's a lot cheaper when it's free uh, called The UX Book. That's a really good one. Again, methodologies case studies like kind of almost how to apply some of this u- user experience hey uh, to jump on that um that methods uh comment that you made sorry i'm, I'm uh, googling it really quick <laughs> um there's a wonderful website that i like to use uh called measuring you and it's uh measuring usability it's all about the methods and whatnot and um you know the 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 guys over there who who write all these articles about you know potentially uh, 
using different metrics in um, in your usability testing. It some of the articles are really good, so that's that's another resource. And and honestly, there are tons of resources all over the web, um, not just books, but uh, you you're on Reddit. You're already looking in the right places. Like this this stuff exists out there. There's a community that you can talk to. Um, if you're having specific problems or, you know, there have been lessons learned other places and people post about them online all the time. Um, I cut you off, Blake. Were you going to keep going with uh, free courses? Uh, yeah. So w- before I do that, is that measuring you like is in the letter U or you, Y-O-U? Or Y O U? As in the letter U. Thank you for catching me on that. Nice. Yeah. All right. So measuring you as in the letter U. Uh, But yeah. So one thing about free courses, I actually learned this from a friend of mine when I was working at a startup. I had no idea that if you have a library card, uh, you can actually get free access to lynda.com courses. And I kind of took a peep earlier and there are more UX courses than there used to be. But plus, there's also some business and marketing courses just to get you like a head start and give you like a different little mindset that you can use. So that's a great resource. I can free. I cannot second Linda enough, and that's Linda with a Y. And uh, man, Linda dot com. I must have taken like thirty courses on there, uh, and like every every course was pretty good. I got. I s- mean, I I gotta say, hang on. Like I used to have a joke at my old workspace about Chris Notter because he was uh he was a character, but uh, a lot of his classes on Linda dot com. I can I can say that they are really valuable. So yeah, go go watch that. Have you have you seen any of the Chris Notter videos, Blake? I don't think I have. Uh, you should look up Chris Notter. Not right now. Well, Chris uh, Chris Notter, it is. That'll be my <laughs> evening tasking, and I'll talk about it on Twitter or something. No, he's he's really knowledgeable, and he breaks it down in a way uh, that's easily digestible. It's it's very good. Is this very Bob Ross for UX? Kind of, yeah, almost. Yes, he paints the trees and the uh, the affinity diagrams and everything. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, for so free classes, and then uh, uh, let's see here. Is there any th- other things that you think uh, blues and souls would need to know? Um, not that you probably don't already know. There's plenty of you know subscription lists and newsletters you can check out. Again, just focus on what you want to be good at. And that's where you find all the resources you can. And the internet is a wonderful place for that. So uh, one other piece of advice that I guess uh, both Blake and I do this, but we have our own RSS feeds that we kind of sift through and we subscribe to several different user experience uh, blogs and and, uh, human factors posts. And we we pull some of these stories for the show. A lot of them are kind of... uh, little iterations on on the bigger picture but uh we tend to go for the bigger picture types of things on the show but there's a lot of news that's always filtering through those things and definitely a valuable resource if you want to uh if you want to check those out the rss feeds and the uh the the feed readers i guess um nick i have one last thing i don't know if we should be talking about it yet but potentially a resource for all you guys like Human Factors Cast is we're opening up a public Slack at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can talk about that. Um, yeah, we are uh, potentially launching either a public Slack or a Discord or some way that our listeners can interact with us and, and sort of, uh, you know, just have a conversation with us. If, if you guys want to, like, send us a, uh, like a like an article that you think we should talk about on the show or just feedback on the show or just general advice that you think may be useful. I mean, we can talk about that on the show as well. So yeah, look forward to that at some point. We are going to launch that soon. Uh, I think we have the Slack set up. Not quite sure if we're going to use Slack or Discord or or what platform we're going to be using, but uh, have a preference. Let us know on all the social media and and we'll, uh, we'll listen to you guys and we'll, we'll head towards that platform. Um, Yeah, that's a great place to find advice. (laughs) Oh, it will be. It's going to be one of the best pieces of advice for human factors in the planet. Ever. Ever. Yep. Forever. All right, man. Well, I'm ready to close it out. How about you? I think we've hit it pretty good today, man. So, Uh yeah, let's close the sucker out. All right. Well, we had a good day. Oh, man. I'm excited for next week. I'm always excited for these shows. I love 
I love breaking this stuff down with you, man. This is this is a, a passion that I'm glad you are on board for, and I get to hang out with my buddy once a week and talk Human Factor stuff. Hey, man, we get to do it on Mondays, which is traditionally the worst day of the week, so it makes it all that much better. That's true. I look forward to my Mondays. All right, everyone, that's it for today. Let us know what you think of these stories. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for stories that we may have missed, you can head on over to our social media. Uh, follow us over on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you are really brave, you can send us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1 HFC. We'll read that sucker on the show. Well, we won't read it. We'll play it because it's a voicemail. <laughs> what am I talking about? You can also support us on our Patreon because you know what? We do bring these things to you ad free. So, uh, you know, we show you love. Maybe you can show us love. If not, that's okay. You can keep listening. But we really do appreciate it when you guys go on there. We got some cool rewards on there. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll gate uh, access to these. No, let's not do that. We won't do that. We bring the advice to you ad free too. All right. So be be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Just make those reviews good because we love hearing from you. And, uh, of course, you can always... Arnstorf, thank you for sitting here with me on a Monday night, breaking down human factor stories and news and tips and books and classes and everything with me. Where can our listeners find you? Well, you guys can let me know what your favorite type of hot dog is or favorite place to get it at Don't Panic UX on Twitter. All right. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter as well at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And until next time, it depends. It depends. It depends. What were the stories this weekend? I don't know. We talked a lot about hot dogs. Hot dogs. It depends on hot dogs. Chris hey. Nodder. <laughs>